It's our delight to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michael Muir. Muir is associate professor in New Testament studies. Uh, he's been here as on the faculty since 2004. He was telling me he actually began his tenure here at DTS in 1993 as a student. So he's been here, what, 21 years, 22 years, and he's also been married to Melanie for 22 years. They have three wonderful children, a playful dog named Shade who catches Frisbees, I guess, and uh, I know that uh, Michael and his family have uh, traveled overseas together and love to do things together. And uh, we love the fact that Michael is a family man, uh, a guy who loves to have fun, but also is uh, one of our esteemed professors here. Would you welcome with me Dr. Michael Muir? Uh, turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, this will be my text for this morning, uh, and I'd like to read it before I, I begin. So uh, go ahead and shut down the email where you're, I know all of you are reading the policy. Uh, now it's uh, time to pay attention up here. Uh, so let me read this to us, and then I'll begin. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and entrust what you heard me say in the presence of many others as witnesses to faithful people who will be competent to teach others as well. Transitions in ministry are very, very difficult. And today is July 1st. It's the first day of the seminary's new uh, calendar year, fiscal year. But it's also the first day of Chaplain Bill's retirement. He is now no longer officially our chaplain. Uh, and that's a difficult transition. That's hard. Uh, we love Chaplain Bill. We enjoy having him around. We appreciate his ministry. But he has transitioned to a new phase of life, and as such, we have to transition as well. Uh, many of you uh, d probably did not ever take classes with Dr. Harold Honer, but he was a professor here for a number of years, 40-plus years, uh, and he suddenly passed away in February of 2009. Uh, and I was on my uh, assignments teaching here, uh, saw him uh, one day, and then the next morning, the dean, uh, John Grassman, called us into his office and informed us that Dr. Honer had passed away. And that was a tough transition. That was a tough transition personally, uh, because I really loved and uh, appreciated Dr. Honer. But it was also tough for us as a department. Our senior statesman had passed away. And it was tough for us as a seminary, because a key voice for academic evangelical scholarship had died. And so in life, you always have to manage these kinds of transitions. And in ministry, it is especially important that we learn how to manage those well. They're very difficult emotionally because obviously when someone transitions out of a ministry, someone that we love is gone. And it's hard to fill that emotional void. It's difficult when people whom you love and cherish are no longer in your midst ministering. Uh, but it's also difficult because sometimes we question whether or not the plans can go forward. Um, we, in ministry, you have goals, you have strategic ideas, you're trying to do the Lord's work, and sometimes key people transition out of those ministries. And you're left wondering, how in the world are we going to continue this? Um, the good thing is, is that obviously we know and confess that the, the success of our ministries does not rely upon us, it relies upon the Lord. But even so, we are called to be faithful during these times of transition, to manage them well, and I think to really plan ahead for them. I've even thought about that personally. Uh, you know I teach in the New Testament department, and uh, I am uh, 44 years old, but I am, if I remember correctly, the youngest member of my department. I've joked with my colleagues that our department could be decimated within five years between retirements and heart attacks. Uh, and uh, so we, we have to be thinking carefully about what are we going to do so that when the seminary celebrates its 100th year, when it celebrates its 125th year, when it celebrates its 200th year, will the seminary still be here proclaiming God's word, preparing leaders, and doing God's work? We have to think about those transitions. And I believe that the scripture that, that we're looking at today teaches us how to manage these kinds of transitions, how to prepare for them. And it's really pretty simple. Paul, uh, in writing 2 Timothy, desired to prepare Timothy for his own transition. You know the, the context of the book. Paul is imprisoned in Rome. It's his second Roman imprisonment, and he can see the handwriting on the wall. He knows that the end is near. And so he's writing to Timothy to get him ready to, uh, for Paul to pass the baton to him, but then also for Timothy to learn to pass the baton to others. 
And so he challenges him to really do two simple things. He wants him to identify the right people and then to develop the right process. I don't know that Paul would have thought in those HR kind of terms, but I think they're helpful for us. Paul encourages Timothy to identify the right people to build into, into his ministry. There's two words here that help us identify who those people are. Paul identifies the people that we need to pass on to as people who are faithful and people who are competent. In other words, people who have the right attitude and have the right ability. Now, in my experience, the, uh, it's easy to find people who can do stuff. Um, in my teaching here, I've found people who can preach, who can exegete, who can uh, identify things in God's Word. But the place where I think most of us fail is that we sometimes have difficulty identifying people who are faithful. That, I think, is the key. And so Paul says to Timothy, identify people who are both faithful and competent, who have the right attitude and the right ability. And those are the people you want to identify as building into to get ready for this transition to move into the next phase of ministry. But not only that, there's, you're supposed to identify the right process as well. Paul uses two words here which I think are very, very critical. He first says to Timothy, entrust what you heard me say. That word implies taking something that's valuable and then giving it to another person, almost passing it along as a sacred trust. Um, the interesting thing is, is though that word doesn't specify exactly how that's to be done. And so this is where I think we can get creative. I think as Christians who desire to see the next generation uh, come to faith and take up the mantle of God's Word and God's kingdom to share with others, we can have some creativity in how we entrust that to others. But without fail, we must pass it on as a sacred trust. We must realize that we have been given a task and our responsibility is to make sure that the next generation catches that and picks it up and passes along. But not only are, are, these, are, are, are we to entrust, but the people that we choose must be competent to teach. This word obviously is freighted with all of the significance that you would imagine. We are to take what we have learned and teach it to others. Part of my responsibility, for example, as a parent is not just to help my kids grow up to adulthood without a major bodily injury, but to teach them why it's important to be faithful to the Lord, why church attendance is important. I have a 16-year-old son, and as you can imagine, 16-year-old sons don't normally spring out of bed on Sunday morning to go to church, but I have to tell him, this is who we are as a people. We gather with God's people. We communicate with them. We commune with them. And we uh, worship together because that is what God calls us to do. And so once we identify the people and once we develop the process of entrusting and training to teach, we are then prepared for the next transition. We are then prepared to leave the scene so that others can follow in our footsteps and continue the work that God has called us to do. I don't know if any of you ever had a lot of time to spend talking with Chaplain Bill, but man, he loved to talk. Uh, uh, there was a couple of times when he caught me in the parking lot, either as he was getting into his car or getting out of his car, and we all know that that's going to be a five or a ten minute conversation. Quite, at, quite loud and punctuated with, uh, with a lot of energy too. But why did Chaplain Bill do that? Why was he a, a talker? It's because he was a people person. He was interested in identifying people who were faithful and competent and encouraging them in the work that they were here to do. It's part of his ministry. It's part of his legacy that we are here and we are about the work of ministry that Chaplain Bill began oh so many decades ago when he began his, his life as a minister. But I also thought a lot about Dr. Honer and his, uh, his ministry as well. If you think about it, Dr. Honer has fulfilled this even today, even though he's not here, his work is being carried on in the faithful transition uh, to others in ministry. Why? Because he trained the people who mentored me. I look at Dr. Dan Wallace and Dr. Hall Harris as my primary mentors on the faculty. And Dr. Harris trained them, uh, excuse me, Dr. Honer trained them. He picked them, he encouraged them, he taught them, he gave them opportunities and developed them into professors. And they have trained me. And guess what? Now I'm developing a vision of how I can train others to take my slot after I am gone. One day I will be gone. But when someone who is faithful is in that spot teaching here at the seminary, then Dr. Honer's vision of what ministry should be in a seminary context will be fulfilled. And it's my responsibility to make sure that that continues even into subsequent generations. So the long and short is, is that transitions are never easy. Transitions in ministry that involve people are oftentimes very challenging because they, they confront our emotions, they confront our goals. 
But Paul gives us a vision for how to make sure that those ministry goals continue. If we identify the faithful and competent people and entrust them so that they may teach, we will ensure that God's work continues to subsequent generations and hopefully for many more decades to come if the Lord chooses to tarry. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us a blueprint for how to reproduce ourselves in others. And I thank you, Lord, that that will help us manage the transitions. Lord, I pray that we won't be afraid of thinking ahead, of thinking about what will the seminary look like when we are gone, or what will our churches look like when we are gone. And Lord, help us to work even now to prepare for that moment of transition by finding people who are faithful, who are competent. And Lord, I pray that we would entrust with them the truth of your word so that they would teach others, and then many more generations for many uh, hundreds of years will hear your word if you choose to tarry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.